to Classic Motors. This week we're looking at Classic Fords and we're beginning with this fantastic Ford Cortina. And I've got Joan, the proud owner here. How long have you had uh, the Cortina for? We've had about 13 years now. 13 years? 13, 14 years, yes. And uh, what's your favourite memory of all time? Um, I think possibly the first time we won a trophy with it. Oh, and really? possibly the first time we got um, a car of the show, which is the... So you the go very best thing. You yes. go around to all the shows. We do. You? do. We. It's our hobby. We enjoy it. But you haven't mm. been doing that for thirteen years. No, have you? we've been doing it about four years. And mm. how long were you actually driving it on the road for then before you started to show it? Oh, a good few years. We took it off the road for twelve months, about ninety-two, uh -huh. and we had a respray, and then. So um, is this the original colour then, it or? Is, uh, it is the original colour. Sebring red. Yes. Oh, red. Sebring red. They were all, um, all named after American car racing tracks the colours ah. there was a Daytona yellow Sebring red and others which I don't remember <laughs> fantastic yes. and is this the original engine uh, yes the original engine and my it's, goodness uh, it's done over 111,000 miles <sighs> it's going round for the second time going for the, and, yes. and how does it sound when it's on the road is it as good as it's, new it's a very rich sound it's nice it's and does nice it need noise. does it need a lot of um of, of you know time spent on it to keep it going not, or? not now it's as, as as good as it can get and it's just a, a case of uh, tender loving care now <laughs> anyway let's go on you've all heard of the ubiquitous z3 roadster but have you heard of the z1 anyone who owned one will remember how the doors always jammed i've said it now anyway here's john stanley's report on it in the 80s bmw's series 3 car was definitely the fashionable item it was there for the shoulder pads and the mobile phones just as much as the enthusiast. But in truth, it was not a particularly safe car. In fact, in Sweden, they banned the big six-cylinder versions because they were considered unsafe. The trouble was primarily that they were not terribly good at the back end, that they were very light and they were very inclined to break away. And this made for an awful lot of accidents and an awful lot of second-hand 3 Series that you want to stay away from. It was a matter of making profits from the uppies and naturally it was good business, but it didn't do anything for their reputations as handling cars. So in just three years they produced a concept car based on the 325i, which was actually to test a new Z axle and rear suspension. It was to have a steel monocoque construction with plastic as a moulded body and indeed plastic floor as well. Just to make it very 80s, it was all recyclable and therefore very green. Part of the concept was actually to have a very smooth under tray. Even the exhaust system was rounded off. And they claimed, probably with some degree success, that it was the first production car to actually have race car ground effects as a form of, of road holding. The low center of gravity with this Z rear axle and all the other bits combined to make it a really much improved car. So when it was shown, there was a huge demand for it. It was really only a concept car, but as a result of demand, two years later, they began making just 10 cars a week in a factory in Munich. There were 8,000 made in all, and officially they were sold at £37,000, but needless to say in the late 80s there were a lot of silly premiums paid. This is that car, it's called the Z1, the Z2 didn't exist, the Z3 we all know and celebrate. The engine was the 2.5 litre that was traditionally in the 325i, it developed a 170 brake horse, the trick was that they placed the whole unit behind the front axle in order to try and improve the suspension and the handling characteristics of the car. This was, of course, a show car, and therefore it was full of gimmicks and full of little things to draw attention. The seats, for instance, are a perfect 80s example. They are silk screened onto leather. And when it comes to doors, nothing gets more complicated if you're a late 80s lady in their evening kit than getting over and down into this machine. The door may have been considered something of a gimmick at the shows, but according to BMW, this is not an affectation.
was interesting. In the late 80s, I spent a lot of time driving a 318i, which, although I didn't own it, I seemed to feel very uncomfortable with. The problem was the back end always was on the move. It was very light and it was very unstable. This, on the other hand, is quite the reverse. These high sills give enormous sense of, sense of rigidity. There is no feeling of vulnerability. There's nothing like the Alpha Spider currently has, where you can feel the rattle and the scuttle shake. This feels very, very rigid, despite actually being made of plastic. A number of things about this are endearing. The gearbox is, as any BMW driver will tell you, a delight to use. The steering is very neutral. The balance of the weight is 49 to 51%. So again, it gave all the right ingredients to those who were criticizing. It proved that BMW could create a really stable platform. Never entirely sure about the lines of the Z1. Will it ever be a true classic? Unlike a lot of these cars here in Birmingham at Cresswell Cars. Now Mike Ford knows more than most about the bottom end of the classic car market. How did he get started? It was a, an interest originally. I worked for mainstream motor dealers in the area from the age of 17. Uh, I got to the point in the late 80s where I was just basically worn out with it uh, and wanted to escape. I mean, you're not at the top end of the market, not being rude, but you're not at the top end of the classic market. What's, what's the, the philosophy behind it? I like the average working man to be able to afford something different and something he's going to enjoy. And I feel that really they can come on here uh, and if they've got 2,000 pounds in their pocket, they can go away with something that's going to be interesting to them. And, and it's going to bring back some nostalgia to them. Often it's where their first employer had that car when they started work or their grandfather had that car or their father did. And it's amazing how the classic market also has moved on. And even cars from the early 80s now are of interest to younger people because that's what dad had when they first remember him having a car. So it, it's an ever moving business. Uh, the other movement you obviously get is in different models. Suddenly you'll get an uprise in price on, on a certain vehicle. Uh, you'll also have pits where certain vehicles just die a death, like P6 Rovers two, three years ago. I could not sell them at all at any price. The last six, seven months I found that all of a sudden there's an interest in them again. Uh, the 3500S people want. Well, to be fair, no, the, the smaller engine ones I think are perhaps in some ways stronger than the bigger engine ones because people do think economy-wise a little, a little bit these days, even with a classic car where they're not going to do a terrific mileage in it, if you've got something that a Sunday afternoon run is going to cost you 50 or 60 pounds worth of fuel, people think twice about doing it. If you've got something that you can go out and spend 20 pounds worth of fuel in, it's more likely that they'll buy it and run it. I mean, when you look around this yard, I mean, what, what's your favourite sort of car? I can't say I've got a favourite. I, I... The one that makes the most money for you? I suppose, yes, <laughs> yes, to be perfectly honest, you're right, yes, it would be, but in terms of driving, I get a kick out of all sorts. I mean, I, I enjoy driving little things like a Trabant. They're just a lot of laughs, terribly crude. In other ways, they're actually terribly practical, and I, I'm actually quite a practically-minded person. I like practical things. Um, so cardboard bodywork was a very good idea? Well, it doesn't <laughs> rust. <laughs> they don't rust. And, and what about big cars? I mean, you've got some big cars here, you know, big old Zodiacs and Daimlers. I mean, what, what, what about big old cars? Big old cars, they've got a place of their own. They're, 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 they're very enjoyable to drive and to use. They tend to motivate people into thoughts of the 50s and 60s, particularly things like Zodiacs. There's a big following for things like that, for the new age teddy boys, as I call them. You get them in and they go to the 50s and 60s dances and they, they thoroughly enjoy, thoroughly enjoy the, the whole feeling of that, that era. Car-wise in particular, nothing really frightens me. Um, I think there's a market for everything somewhere, and it's just finding the man for the vehicle. And I suppose in some senses, that's exactly what I do do. I'll put my money into things and be willing to sit on it if necessary and just wait for the man who actually desires that vehicle. And I can save him a lot of looking around because the chances are he will find something very obscure and something that he happens to want here. Of course, the saddest moment in your relationship with any classic car is that dreadful time when you have to say goodbye. Eamon O'Neill reports. It's the end of the line for 337 YFM because today this much-loved 1962 Ford Anglia, resplendent in her Caribbean turquoise and ermine white, makes her final journey to a better place. For 32 years, she's been a faithful servant to a loving family, but frankly, she's past it. It's going to be strange when you look through the window and not see it there anymore, because, you know, we always keep our eye on it and look through the window, cars there.
It's been a very, very good servant to us, and it's been part of the family for 32 years. We took a photograph of it all the time. Wherever we went, we used to stop, we'd go to Calendar, we'd take a photograph of it. So it's, uh, we, we'd know, those, those were our memories. My dad bought it for me as a present. He gave his savings of £425 for that car. The Anglia. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? Yes, it is. Oh, I like that one. I notice they haven't got any two-tone ones, though. They're all one colour. Mm. Before setting off on the fateful journey, the Hughes took a final nostalgic look at Ford's original launch film for the Anglia. Remember your dad, when he bought that car, he said, look, we've got a deluxe. <laughs> <laughs> We never used to moan at putting petrol in, did we? At uh, one and nine a gallon. I think I remember once you having a good moan when it went to four and six. <laughs> 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 oh, and that wouldn't be allowed. Definitely wouldn't be allowed. Sitting on the bonnet, the roof. Especially with the balls. <laughs> <laughs> but now the time had arrived for their beloved Anglia to take her final journey. Do you find people stare at you when you drive? Oh, yes, around? very much so. Oh, yes, we're like royalty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, they they stare at us, all right. Wherever we go, like comments this morning, a, a chap pulled up in his car and said, Bye, you look after that. And I said, Well, I have to because it's it's part of me. But to, to lose it after 32 years is a, it, it's, it's a big wrench for me. So you really do regard it as allowing her to rest in peace? That's right, yes, yes, very much so. She's she's old now and she's had a good life. She's had a very good life, but she's old now and she's, she's uh, she wants a rest because she's been a working car, she's worked every day of her life. But it's going to her best home because I never wanted it to be go to a scrapyard because I couldn't bear that because it's been such a good friend to us. The Hughes Anglia will be looked after by James Peacock. He started the Molesworth Motor Museum in response to friends' requests to take care of their ageing cars. Uh, we look after cars for people for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, Molesworth's the sort of place where you can leave a car and be sure it's going to be coveted, if you like, you know. Coveted indeed. Just look at this classic Lotus built in 1950 by Colin Chapman himself. A lot of the ideas that he had that went into Formula One, which uh, you know people appreciate now and use, uh, are, are in that car. Is the Lotus Three yours? No, it's a friend of mine who's suddenly fallen on hard times, and he was very worried about where it was stored. And we, I mean, we don't charge him anything for it. We just said, well, look, you know, stop worrying, bring it here. All these cars have stories that reflect the love and loyalty of their owners. This is a 1930 Morris with under four and a half thousand miles on the clock. It really was used only to go to church on Sundays and it stands cheek by jowl with a sinful Ferrari Dino. But this is a themed collection. The common bond is affection. And Mr Hughes from Chester with this marvellous for Anglia, you know, that's a car that he didn't want to sell or dispose of. So, you know, what better than to let other people enjoy it? I think he's enjoyed it, you know. So 337 YFM is now officially a museum piece. James, you do the honours, please. And Jack and Margaret, it's a sad day, but it's not farewell, it's au revoir, isn't it? It is. It is I'm very, very sad to see it go. I've got a brand new Ford outside. Can I give you a lift home? No, I think I'll take this one. You can't. No. Aww, at least it had a happy ending. The Morris 1000, my mum and dad's first car. In fact, it was the first car that I ever had a ride in. Number plate, Jess 690. What a beauty. Anyway, it's time for a quick break now. After the break, another Ford, the Cortina, and more from me and Chris. Catch you in a minute. Welcome back to Classic Motors. Now, when Uncle Henry came to Britain and set up that car plant in Dagenham to start building cars, well, Ford from almost day one was one of Britain's most popular models. And even today, all the old Fords seem to have entered the classic stakes. There's more one-make clubs about Ford than any other make in the business. This is the somewhat bulbous Ford Prefect. It was the deluxe version, if you like, of the famous Ford Pop. But if you think this was ugly, just you wait. 
Of course, styling in 1954 was very different from today, but uh, even so, you can't forgive the console a great deal. Um, my uncle had one, though, and uh, he used to take us down to Somerset regularly with no problem at all. This one has a period accessory. This sun visor is something that enthusiasts will kill for. Ford, of course, an American company, and who could doubt the American origins of the styling on the Mark III Zodiac? Wonderful fins to die for. <laughs> Oh, memories. I remember spinning one of these round Hyde Park on a wet Thursday night. This one has a wonderful interior. It's been beautifully retrimmed and all for two and a half thousand quid. Of course, if the top of the range Zodiac is too strong for you, why not go for the economy version, the Zephyr 6? This guy's added portholes on the side and that's not all. He's put a Perkins diesel engine under the bonnet. So you get the style of the Zephyr with superb diesel economy. It takes all sorts to make a world. Now let's join Steve Vokins at the National Motor Museum for another classic Ford story. At the start of the 1960s, car ownership in Britain was nowhere near today's current levels. And for many people, the task of getting from A to B meant relying on good old public transport. Now, to an enterprising company like the Ford Motor Company of Britain, this was a golden opportunity. Austin Morris had their Mini and their 1300 range, but Ford decided to do something entirely different. Something conventional, bigger, but affordable, and the sort of car everyone really wanted. And the car they made sold a million in four years. It's the incredibly popular Ford Cortina. Now, just because the Cortina was a family car didn't mean you couldn't have fun in it, as these head cases are about to prove. When the world's finest drivers get together, something exciting is bound to happen. And in this case, it's the discovery of an exciting new sport called auto bobbing. Here's what the famed bobsled run looks like from the driver's seat of the world famous Cortina. Championship sleds travel the course at about 50 miles per hour. And the Cortina exceeds that speed while taking some of the turns with only six inches of clearance. Former world champion Jim Clark says it's the most exciting sport he's ever tackled. We'll take his word for it. But if you have any doubts, he recommends a Cortina, lots of nerve, and plane tickets to Italy for you and your doctor. When BMC launched their mid-sized saloons, they named them after Tweedy University towns. When Ford named their car, they chose the site of the 1960 Winter Olympics, Cortina d'Ampezzo, and straight away the idea suggested travel, excitement, something new instead of just transport. So the car was off to a good start. It also had pin-sharp lines right up to the moment, with things like the, the CND rear lights, the big chrome appearance, everything suggested I want the car, and the public really wanted it. For power, the engineers chose a 1200cc and a 1500cc overhead valve engine, perfectly adequate for the job, until along from Norfolk came a little man called Colin, who put a twin cam engine in, stripes down the side, and went racing. And his name was Chapman. To drive, as you might expect, the museum's Cortina is a sedate experience by modern standards and noisy to boot. But the engine noise, like that of a Morris Minor, is like a favourite tune, once heard, never forgotten. The steering's light and the brakes are adequate, but that metal steering wheel with no padding is worryingly close and hard. This beauty has covered only 39,000 miles from new and is used from time to time by Bewley's education department for taking school groups around the grounds to demonstrate the feel of 60s motoring. In essence, this was a car that was right for its time. Fresh, forward-looking 
and with enough space to carry the post-war baby boom family and all its luggage. The Cortina did in the 60s what the Model T had done 40 years earlier. It offered reliable, flexible and enjoyable transport and made motoring affordable to an entirely new class of people. And in so doing, it emptied the Clapham Omnibus. Oh, a lovely Ford Cortina. And this is a lovely Beetle, one of my favourite cars. And I'm with Robert, the proud owner. How long have you had the Beetle, Robert? Oh, about two years. Now, I've been hearing that your wife gets a bit fed up of you doing up these classic cars. Well, she, she does really, but... What is your bit of advice? If your wife or your partner doesn't like you getting involved with these classic cars, what would you say to win them round? Get in and drive it. Get in and drive it? What did yeah. you do with this car? Well, we went out, well, she wanted to have a ride out when I'd done it. And when we took it out, she just got in and she found out how comfortable it was. So when you brought it back and it was all dirty and she went, don't you dare bring that round here, what did you do to make her? Well, she just, she just doesn't bother no more now. She just likes it as it stands and she's like keen on it now, really, since I've done it up. But it's beautiful. And how old is it? Uh, 1972, it's nearly 30 year old now. So you've been pretty busy with it? Oh, yeah, yeah. And your wife hadn't been seeing much of you? Well, I say she's in garage is next to the house, so she, she knows I'm there. She knows yeah. you there. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I once raced one of these round uh, Brands Hatch, and I tell you what, inside there, it's that old gear stick, it's like a big stick of a of a bus and a big steering wheel, but it's great fun to, uh, it to is, motor it around. Is very, it's very comfortable and very nice to and drive. And the sound yeah. of the Beatles, you just can't beat them. Well, that's all for this week. Join us next week. We're going to be looking at an old Bentley, some more gorgeous Ferraris, and the fantastic and completely over-the-top XJ220. See you then.